like to welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar. My name is Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy and Bioeconomics Specialist with MDCU Extension and the moderator of our webinar series. Uh, following our traditional format, we will have a series of presentations. Uh, in fact, five of them, we ha have a pretty full docket. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the presentations, following the presentations. We ask that you use either the Q, we prefer that you use the Q&A tool, but you can also use the chat feature to ask questions. Uh, we're happy to answer them. We encourage you to, to, to ask them, you know, as we're going through. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, we do archive them uh, on the internet. They're on YouTube as well as on the uh, webinar series webpage. If you have any technical difficulties uh, as, during today's webinar, feel free to contact me uh, either using the chat or by email. Uh, david.ripplinger at ndsu.edu, and I'll do my best to, to address your concerns. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Parman. All right. Thanks, Dave. And like I said, my goal today was to remember to share the screen before I start talking. So I feel like with that, mission accomplished, right? All right. So uh, like, like, like with our uh, typical format that we've been doing now for several years, uh, Try to stick it to uh, stick to 15 minutes or so uh, that that I'm going to be talking here about this, and really just two topics today uh, for this one: fall fertilizer prices, and then inflation and interest rates, and what's going on with that, real quick. So uh, uh, right now, uh, what what's been happening so far, uh, most of the summer, throughout a lot of the summer, is uh, fertilizer prices have been sliding. So I want to show just three charts essentially that are sort of the main drivers, the, the variables that have impact uh, fertilizer prices in the US. And one is the price of corn. And in some recent research that's been shown, the price of corn is even a bigger driver than LNG, natural gas prices, or, or even um, you know what's going on uh, abroad geopolitically to an extent. But We've seen corn. This is just the uh, December, and I'm, you know, I'm not giving a market talk. We obviously leave that to Frayne. I'm just illustrating with this chart what uh, December 23 uh, spot prices for corn have done, and it's been sliding, you know, since uh, since April of 22 all the way through. Uh, so, and then we we you know peaking out around almost 680 down to around 481, 485 as of uh, this morning. And then uh, here's what natural gas prices have done. And no surprise, when fertilizer prices were peaking, uh, natural gas prices were uh, around that spring of 22, uh, some of the highest they'd been really since February, a quick spike in February of 21. But uh, they've come off quite a bit and are just above, you know, two bucks, two and a half dollars per uh, million BTUs for natural gra gas. So that's where you see where we were in 22 versus now uh, heading into fall of 23. So natural gas prices down considerably, corn prices way off the, the high from uh, 18 months ago or so. But one thing that also that happened recently, uh, Chinese uh, urea export, export policies have had a little bit of an impact on um, fertilizer prices, name, namely urea. Uh, and this is a uh, uh, quote directly from Reuters, uh, Red a few days ago, is that China is slowing uh, their fertilizer exports, which is raising some industry concerns, especially in India, who's a big uh, receiver of Chinese exported urea. China, China exports about a third of the global urea. And two Chinese state-owned companies are focusing solely on domestic supplies. And basic, and what, what happened not too long ago, I think around last week, 500,000 uh, uh, metric tons of urea headed for India were held up at a port due to this export suspension that took effect immediately. So that's having the, a look for at least for the time being, briefly, a little bit of a muting effect on this downward slide. So moving on real quick to what fertilizer prices have done. You look at urea, the red line is uh, 2023 and the green is 2022, obviously considerably off the highs when it was over $1,000 a ton last spring, right now sitting around $550 and basically moving sideways the last couple of weeks on urea uh, with with uh, starter fertilizer, 103400. Uh, again, 
consider way off the peak. I mean, it, it came down sharply from August to September, down from seven hundred to six hundred dollars a ton. Little bit of little slight increase in the last week. I think a lot of that's from the concern of what what just happened in China. And it's not the amount that was turned around, okay? That's not a, a huge amount of fertilizer in the global grain scheme. It's the policy that China has has stated that they're going to adopt. That that's that's why you know it's kind of moved moved upwards there um, for that product. And then our phosphorus fertilizers, okay? MAP and DAP again coming down way off the high. They're peaking uh, in 2022. You look at the green line there, and these these are according to DTN. Uh, spring of 22, up over $1,000 a ton for uh, MAP and DAP, now down to around $700, $750 a ton and kind of moved, edging up a little bit in the last week, but mostly moving sideways for the last three or four weeks or so. Uh, and and kind of where we are really in, in, in terms of a lot of these fertilizer prices is where we were in the fall of 2021, when you look at it, when, when there was this big concern, you know, that fertilizer was running upwards, we're kind of crossing that threshold now where we're where we were when we were getting concerned about fertilizer prices edging up. And we'll see if it continues to slide downward because the price of corn, where it's at, seems to indicate that it might continue trending uh, uh, downwards as well as natural gas prices. Now, what China did uh, in suspending exports, I, I don't know how brief if that'll be a brief uptick where the market digests what they've done and see then then kind of takes a look at how uh, global supplies are going to be reallocated or perhaps coming from another uh, uh, exporter for to to fill any of uh, say India's uh, uh, demand requirements. If if somebody else is going to step up and do that, uh, that remains to be seen. Uh, and, and and a lot of times with these things, it takes a little bit of time to sort it out. For instance, when Russia invaded Ukraine, there were big concerns about this very thing. And eventually the world sort of sorted it out. They carved out a, a, an export policy for Russia, et cetera. So we'll see how what happens. But again, um, at least two of the three variables that heavily influence the price of fertilizer have been trending towards lower prices it's hard to say exactly where it'll be. And it, again, it's going to depend on what China does being such a large player in the world, if they continue to slide downward or if they've kind of leveled off for a while in, in kind of a wait and see pattern. And then potash prices, you know, the, the, the final fertilizer product I, I tend to cover that's, that's even gone down past that 2021 threshold. And it's, you know, approaching closer to the long run um, five-year average. So Again, long story short, we've seen fertilizer prices slide dramatically over the last six months. We're starting to approach our longer run averages in, in cost per ton. Will it continue to slide? That remains to be seen. And China's policy, at least in the short run, is going to have an impact on if they continue to move downwards or possibly tick up a little bit into the future. Next, talking about... Um, interest rates and the Fed real quick. I know that's something we've been talking about in, in a lot of these meetings that have been conducted. Uh, the 30-year mortgage rate, this was pulled as of uh, this morning, but it was as of last week. Uh, the re remaining above 7%, which is you know the highest in, in decades, except for the period there briefly last November when the 30-year rate uh, just peaked above 7% for a couple of weeks before sliding down to around the 6% range. Uh, as of like I said last week, around 7.1%. And a lot of that's been driven by inflation and the Fed's actions to combat inflation. So here's the latest, um, uh, oops, excuse me, the latest um, chart to come out from the uh, uh, BLS. Overall inflation up to 3.7%, mostly due to energy cost increases. So, it, and a lot of that's been gasoline. So it was a little bit higher than what the, the the trades were expecting or industry was expecting inflation to come out at, but not dramatically. And as far as headline inflation goes, which does uh, include energy and food, it's it's up a bit and uh, over last month. And the big reason there is because of energy costs. And then core inflation was at about 4.3 percent. Uh, down a little bit from the previous month and very close to in line with what industry and trades thought it was going to be. 
Now, real quick, and, and I know I hammer this point all the time uh, on inf- on uh, unemployment when we're talking about inflation and then and then interest rates. And the reason for that is simple, simply because of the fact that a lot of what the Fed's doing with interest rates to slow the economy uh, involves unemployment or the employment situation. And in other words, one of the things is wage growth that tends to take place uh, when you have these inflationary periods. Uh, wages can uh, continue to increase, causing folks to want to go out p- perhaps and buy more because they're able to negotiate higher salaries. And wage growth can be driven a lot in part by uh, how many um, unemployed per- people there are relative to empl- uh, a job availability. Okay, so if we look at the unemployment rate just right now, and this just from the most recent report, it's still at a historically low level. Last check, they said, I saw a headline where it said it surged to 3.8%. I mean, that's that's pretty misleading when you consider that 3.8% is still historically low. Yeah, you're coming off three and a half, but 3.8 is a very low unemployment rate. And if it wasn't for the fact that August 18, uh, August of 2018, August of 2019, when you look at this chart was so low, it would still be, we'd be in historic post-pandemic um, low uh, unemployment. And this is that number of job openings relative to uh, people looking for work. And it's less than one, which indicates there's more open jobs, um, almost twice as many open jobs as there is people looking for work. So what does that do? It puts people in a position to negotiate for higher salaries. They have no fear of switching jobs and being able to find employment. And if a company does have to um, go through a round of layoffs or contraction in order to uh, exist in this higher interest rate environment, those people laid off don't have too much uh, uh, problem finding a new job uh, because of how many job openings there are. And, you know, I've I've said it before, but I have a theory on this, that a lot of what's also helping drive the fact that unemployment isn't much of a factor despite higher rates, not only the job openings, but the ability of people to find those jobs quickly due to like job search sites like Indeed and, 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 uh, you know, the older one, monster.com and simply hired all that kind of stuff. The availability, if, if you're, for instance, a, a truck driver or something like that, and for whatever reason your company folds up, you would have no problem looking uh, for available positions and finding them extremely quickly because of the advent of the internet, which makes this current situation a bit different than it was, say, in the 1980s when there was no internet. And if you did get laid off, you had to make phone calls or check the, you know, the want ads for help wanted or something. Now, an internet search and you can find hundreds of them. So that's one of the uh, some of the challenges that the Fed is uh, is dealing with here, and that yeah, they're raising rates to help curb spending and and slow the growth rate of the economy, but it's just um, it's just not really happening as much as you think because of this this unemployment um, situation. And so, in in essence, the recent data was mixed, you know, basically favoring a pause. So the Fed's meeting this month uh, in September. Core inflation down slightly, head, headline inflation up a bit, but mostly due to gasoline. Whole, wholesale inflation up a little bit relative to expectations, but not dramatically. And part of that, again, gasoline. And then unemployment up a bit, but we're coming off of historic lows and it's still near historic lows. So by and large, the most recent data favors a pause by the Fed. I'm not saying it's impossible that they raise rates, but it, but it's a lot of... Uh, writing says right now that that it's unlikely and it's extremely unlikely that they lower them. And then the other thing is CD and treasury rates have continued to edge upwards. If you look at uh, CDs being offered on, on a one year, you can get 5.45%. And, you know, treasuries right now, a 10 year will pay, pay 4.1%. And then the shorter runs, even a, a one year treasury will pay a uh, 5.221% yield. So uh, we're seeing a lot of these other investment opportunities uh, that haven't been a realistic option for folks. Uh, they're becoming a lot more attractive as these as these interest rates tick up. And so that and I, I talked about it in a previous talk before, but something to think about there is how that may have a crowding out effect a little bit on on land prices. And then finally, I just wanted to show this. And, and I guess I want to pose the question at the end as far as uh, inflation and interest rates go is this is what uh, GDP growth has been quarter three of uh, 
two all the way through quarter three of 2023. And the, the quarter three is an estimate because we're in it right now at two and a half percent. So I would ask you, if you're wondering what interest rates are going to do, or at least what the Fed is going to do, what do you think would happen if the Federal Reserve suddenly dropped the federal funds rate quickly in the next few months down to, say, a half a percent or something like that, and interest rates drop substantially uh, in the next few months? What do you think would happen with inflation if that were the action taken? Okay. Do you think it would stay around three and a half percent? Do you think it would continue to go down or would you see inflation explode again in the coming months if that were to take place? And the reason I put that out there to you is when you're thinking about how long are we going to live in an environment where rates are seven, perhaps eight percent or so, uh, ask yourself what would happen if rates fall dramatically in the next year, six months or so? Uh, what would happen with inflation then? And then would the Fed have to get even more aggressive with the federal funds rate to slow it down? because uh, they would have lost some of their credibility on how long they're going to keep them high. And that is actually something that happened in, in the 80s when the Federal Reserve was bouncing uh, the federal funds rate up and down to try to get out ahead of inflation. But when they would drop it, inflation would spike up. So that's the thing, kind of the the, the take home of, of this, this message here is that, yes, fertilizer prices have been sliding. Uh, there was uh, some, some global um, event decision making going on by China that's that's impacted that trend of it continuing to slide downwards. But two major variables influencing fertilizer prices are still favoring it to tread downward. We'll see what happens with China. And then as far as interest rates go and inflation, uh, kind of a mixed um, report coming reports coming out of August, probably favoring the Fed to pause rate hikes for September, but certainly leaving the door open for the November meeting. Uh, on on another rate hike. Then, if it, right now um, the data essentially not moving or basically hitting hitting expectations or or slightly trending down slowly, might favor a pause. But I think a continued very slow trend downwards in November and the Fed might still want to be more aggressive and do a, do another rate hike then, which is uh, kind of what markets are thinking as well. So I will be on at the end of the. Um, webinar uh, to answer any questions uh, as usual as our, our typical format. And with that, I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dr. Frain Olson, who will be your next presenter. Thank you very much. Um, so again, here, uh, Frain Olson, I'm the crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, here's my contact information. So if there is something you think about later, you want to visit about, uh, please don't hesitate to either email or call. I'll try and, and get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, my my schedule is getting kind of busy now as we move into the fall season, but I will do my best to get back to you as quickly as possible. So I want to start out with some some of the big key takeaways. So here are, if if the next couple slides are my big takeaways that I want you guys to remember, then I have some, some figures and tables and charts to reinforce it. So uh, first, we got USDA report out on Wednesday. Um, and we did get an update on both the corn and soybean yield forecasts. Uh, what's interesting about the September forecast is that that is the first time that USDA not only takes a farmer survey, uh, uses satellite imagery or the, what they call remote sensing uh, to make yield estimates, but they also have what they call objective yield estimates. So they actually send uh, contract employees out into randomly selected fields to actually do yield counts just like a crop adjuster would do. Um, so we have now have three sources of data instead of just two sources. So they, as they get closer to harvest, we're trying to really zero in on what the yield and yield estimates were. Um, the yield S adjustments, we were expecting to both a slightly re slight reduction in both corn and soybean yield forecasts. We got those very near what the trade estimates were. I'll show you that in just a few minutes. The surprise and the reason the corn prices went down and kind of pulled uh, soybeans and wheat with it, was that we had an increase in planted acreage. Now, I saw a few things coming across the wire, the news wires, and I know there's a, some splashes in social media that everybody's all up in arms about where did USDA find all these extra acres. So I did want to talk about that specifically. Um, in the September report, when September report comes, comes through, uh, USDA can also now begin cross-checking the survey data they got from farmers with their FSA acreage certifications. 
So now they're combining the two data sources, the FSA certification, and even though FSA hasn't compiled all of the total numbers, they've got a lot of the numbers in the system and they've been analyzing them. And they compare and share that with the people that put together with NAFS, the Ag Statistics Service, and they compare those to make sure are we, we're, we're trying to be as accurate as possible um, for the acreage, both planted acreage and harvested acreage. And, you know, 774,000 acre increase in harvested area for uh, corn sounds like a really big number. But when you put this in perspective, that increase is less than 1%. Okay, so there's, that's really only, it's less than a 1% adjustment. And when we're talking, you know, 87 million acres, you know, the 1% plus or minus, that's pretty easy. And also you got to remember that when USDA does, does their surveys of farmers with a June report saying, how many acres did you actually seed? A lot of farmers will round, they'll round up, they'll round down, you know, and so, so they are estimates, uh, but when they go into the FSA office, you better have that number exact. And so when we start cross-checking, even though not everybody, uh, not all farmers enroll in farm programs or participate in the farm programs, we can still use that as a benchmark. So I just wanna say, from my perspective, um, I don't get freaked out about this. I know it was a bigger number than I think a lot were expecting, but please realize that that's well within the margin for forecasting and the margin for sampling. Cause I, I do a lot of sampling work over the years and, you know, plus or minus 1%, man, you're hitting it right on the mark. So another thing that happened in the reports that we got was USDA did re reduce the wheat production and export levels, forecasted export levels for both Australia and Canada. One comment on Canada really quick, the number that USDA is using is essentially the one that came out of Statistics Canada a while ago. Um, Statistics Canada right now in today, right now today in this, in this stage is looking at satellite imagery and trying to forecast yields primarily through satellite imagery. Um, they don't do a lot of ground truthing because of the cost uh, in, involved in that. So I would not be surprised personally, my personal opinion, that as we get closer to harvest, we get more harvest reports coming out of Canada, that we start to see in particular, the wheat yields continue to slip a little bit. Um, I have less of a read on what the canola yields are. Um, I do think the canola may hold up a little bit better um, because of the dry weather and the timing of the heat and, and, and conditions in Canada. But I would not be surprised as we, we start seeing a little bit more of a, uh, the top end of the Canadian wheat crop coming down. Um, the other comment just from U.S. spring wheat harvest, because I've been talking to some of the elevators, talking to some farmers as they go through their harvest. Uh, we early reports are suggesting that the spring wheat protein levels are below average. So yields are ha hanging in there. Um, I think everybody's a little bit surprised at the test weights. Test weights have been stronger than I think a lot of folks were expecting given the dry weather. But we are seeing the protein levels come in a little bit below average, which is also indicative of some really nice big plump kernels. So as you get higher test weights, you get high, higher plump kernels you tend to have a lower percentage protein. Now, but coming into harvest, the protein spreads from 14 to 15 going up was about one cent per bushel. Um, now it's anywhere from four to five cents per bushel. On the way down from 13, from 14% and under, before harvest, we were about two cents per bushel, uh, two cents per fifth, excuse me, two cents per fifth drop. We're now looking at eight cents per fifth drop. So, there are some, some kind of issues starting to show up. It looks like we're gonna have slightly below average protein. Uh, for those that are interested in that, I typically don't see major adjustments in these levels uh, throughout the rest of the winter season. So if you have some lower protein stuff, you put it in the bin, you're hoping for the protein premiums to change uh, and, and it store your way out of the problem. Uh, based on history and what I have historically seen happening, that typically doesn't happen. We might get a little bit of improvement, but really not enough to justify the cost of storage. One more comment before I jump into the actual numbers from the report. You may have been hearing that transit through the Panama Canal is starting to slow. So they use a lake, Lake, uh, lake Gatan Lake, excuse me, so I'm stuttering again, um, they use that lake, the water in that lake, to be able to pump the water in and out of the Panama Canal to be able to get the ships to transit from the Atlantic to the Pacific or Pacific to the Atlantic. Well, because of, of some pretty severe drought conditions, that lake has very, very low water levels. 
And so they're not able to pump as much water as quickly as, po- as, as they normally do. So that means that from entering to exiting the Panama Canal is getting slower. Uh, wait times are currently anywhere from 14 to 21 days. Um, so the number of vessels going back and forth, both east and west, uh, has, has slowed. So these restrictions, the slower pace is expected to continue into 2024, at least into the early parts of next year. Um, and normally I wouldn't bring this much, up much, but there was a colleague of mine uh, that pointed out, actually the amount of agricultural products going through the Panama Canal has increased in the last several years. So I went back at, and, and dug some numbers up and I was actually surprised. I Typically I say, well, there isn't a lot of grain that goes through the Panama Canal system. But over the last couple of years, there has been an increased level of that. So if we look at the 2022 numbers, just for reference, if we look at all U.S. soybean exports, about 20%, 26% of that volume went through the Panama Canal, about 17% of all corn, about 6% of all wheat exports went through the Panama Canal. Now, if we isolate and look at just the soybeans exported through the Gulf, like all of the, the barge traffic coming from the middle of the soybean, corn soybean country into the, the Louisiana Gulf or the Texas Gulf, if we isolate just those bushels that come out of the Gulf of Mexico, almost half go through the Panama Canal. So this is a big deal, potentially a big deal for agriculture. It's going to probably change some of the, the, the flow patterns, how we get soybeans moved from the United States into the international markets. And I, I say may, this may have an impact on soybean shipments through the PNW. So because of this backlog, the extra cost of going through either through the Panama Canal or around the Cape of Good Horn in South Africa as an alternative route, uh, we may see some of those soybeans in this region being more diverted to the PNW region instead. So we'll have to watch what happens to basis levels and those throughputs. To show you the numbers specifically, um, so the blue line on top was the average trade estimate so this is the, before the report comes out, they, they uh, survey uh, the, the forecasters and the, and the folks that are putting together their own private estimates on what do you expect the USDA to release? So that's the, the column uh, in blue on the very top. Um, the, in the highlighted black towards the bottom is the number that we got last uh, month. And then the number in red in the var- very bottom is what we got this month. Now, those numbers are for forecasts for ending stocks. How much grain are we going to have in reserve just before harvest of next year? So we're trying to do a lot of forecasting forward and saying, what are we going to have for reserves about this time next year? The, the wheat number was very, very close. It was basically unchanged from last month. Nobody was expecting any big adjustments. For the corn number, we were expecting that corn ending stocks to decrease. So that's both production and consumption. The production part, most of that was in the form of a lower yield forecast. Well, yes, we did get the lower yield forecast, but we got the increase in acreage. So total production was actually very similar to what we saw um, from last month's numbers. So there really wasn't, there was actually a slight increase in ending stocks because of some other adjustments on the demand side. On the soybeans, Kind of the same, similar story. We were expecting to see the soybean yields drop off. There was very little adjustment in the planted and harvested acreage, but that yield reduction wasn't quite as large as what the trade was expecting. So when you in, take in an aggregate, it was the corn number that surprised everybody. They were looking for a decrease from last month to this month, but we actually got a slight increase. And that was kind of the surprise. If we look specifically at the yield numbers, and then obviously total production as a result of that. Again, the blue line on the very top is what the average trade estimate was. The black line towards the, the uh, highlighted black towards the bottom is what we had last month. And then the red line on the very bottom is the number we actually received. So if you compare the blue line to the red line, you know, from a yield standpoint, 173.5 versus 173.8, very, very similar. Um, actually, very similar to the kind of yields we got uh, last year. Okay. Now, the difference, obviously, is our total production went up because of the increased acreage for corn. On the soybean side, 50.2 versus 50.1, pretty much right on the mark, spot on. The, the production, total production numbers were very, very similar. So not a lot of shock value on the soybean side. 
to put this graphically, when we look at total corn production, this is actually from the, the Secretary of Ag's briefing report. So if we look at those little blue dots, that's what the, the uh, private forecasters are expecting. And then the little red square is what the NAS estimate was. So that's what the USDA is forecasting versus what the private traders were expecting. So if you look at August, USG report was right in the middle of where everybody was expecting it. You look at September, definitely towards the high end. And that was the reason that we had the surprise and the, and the downward pressure on corn prices. When we look at the states by state, where's the corn going to be produced? What were the shifts that we saw in production? Now, this is the change. So the, the, the number in there, for example, in North Dakota of 138, that's the USDA forecast for the average corn yield. The 5.3 underneath means that that was 5.3 bushels per acre higher than last year. So we're using last year as a reference point. The reason I wanted to show this very quickly is notice where we're seeing some reductions versus where we're seeing the increases. The point I'm trying to make here, last year, we had really, really good yields in the heart of the Corn Belt. So Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, they all had even, well, parts of Nebraska had some drought issues. But those areas, Minnesota, those areas were really had some very, very good, fantastic yields. It was the outside, it was outside or the fringes for the Corn Belt that really had some of the production issues. Well, this year, essentially the opposite is happening. So some of the major problems, I shouldn't say major problems, but some of the lower yields that we're seeing, some of those, well, we're not, we're having a good year, but not a fantastic year are happening in the middle of the Corn Belt. And those fringe areas or these transition areas as we move around the outside belt of the corn area is where we're having some increase or pickup in production. So it, it's kind of the, it's the same story. It's just, we're flipping the geography. So you gotta be very careful as you're listening to yield and yield reports and what farmers are harvesting and what they're seeing out in the field and where are we talking about? What region of this of the US are we speaking of? On the soybean side, again, just very similar to what we saw on the corn. This is for total production. So total bushels produced. The blue dots are the private estimates. And then the red squares, what USDA or the NAS, National Ag Statistics Service, actually came out with. Last month, um, USDA came up kind of on the low side, a little bit of a surprise. And that's why we got quite a lift in the soybean market. This September, the September report this month, right exactly with what the, what other private analysts and traders were expecting. So the, it was really kind of a neutral kind of report for soybeans, a neutral report for wheat, but it was a downward pressure on the corn crop. Similar story with soybean yields. Again, is this going to be higher or lower than last year? Um, when we look at, at national average yields, they're a little bit higher this year than we saw last year, but we're also in those outside, those fringe areas, having a little bit better crop. Now, in North Dakota, we're down a bit from what we were expecting or what we saw last year. That's the current expectation. But you look up and down the plain states, and almost every one of those is either a either slight increase or a pretty significant increase from last year. So even though, again, there are some areas in the core corn belt that are showing some stress, you get just outside of that Iowa, Illinois uh, Minnesota kind of range and you get either east or west and suddenly the soybean yield potential increases. So with that, that's the end of my uh, discussion. I will stop sharing and we will hand things off to Mr. Petrie. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Just give you a quick update on the competing meats and then the cattle situation, particularly want to uh, compare uh, this year with the previous 2014 record year to see how we're doing on cattle prices. So first of all, just going to start off with kind of a drones view of the entire uh, meat, livestock meat sector in the U.S. Uh, basically, you know, commercial red meat and poultry production is in a long-term uptrend. It culminated last year, 2002, with uh, record high uh, uh, meat production, 107.5 a billion pounds there, and uh, and uh, this year, the Frank mentioned the WASDE report that just came out on Tuesday. Uh, USDA was still kind of at record production until the report came out. Now and they've lowered production. Uh, beef production is down almost five percent this year, and while the others 
uh, are hanging in there a little higher. So anyway, uh, as of now, then we don't have a record year this year. But my main thought here is that we last year, 2002, we had record high meat production. When I'm giving this uh, presentation live, I usually ask the audience, what does record high production usually mean to prices? And usually I see a lot of thumbs uh, pointing downward. But uh, the only way we could have higher prices with uh, high production, of course, is if we had make it up on the demand side, strong demand. And we did have strong demand for uh, meat last year. Uh, uh, Brian showed you the low unemployment fits into that. And also we were coming out of COVID, so restaurants were restocking and so on. So interesting, even though we had record high meat production, just go across there starting in the upper left. Hog prices reached a record. When you see that little record icon, means an all-time record high. We had record high uh, uh, hog prices there in uh, July of uh, last year, and then they came down. And, and all of these are going to have a similar theme. We had record high prices last year. They have came down. They're still above. The purple line is 2017 to 21. The blue line is 2022, and the red line is 2023. That's on uh, all my charts. And so the theme is that we're off record this year, but we're still above average. And so on the right-hand side, again, is lambs. Lambs were record high there in May of 2022. It actually came off quite drastically, but now have improved up to uh, above average levels on chicken prices down in the lower left. Uh, Kind of the same story, record high last year in May and came off there. They're lower than last year, but still above average. And, you know, turkey prices were record high last Thanksgiving. And, and they've also came up, come, come off some from, from last year, but are, 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 uh, above average. So last year, record high production, record high prices. Now when we get into cattle, cattle prices were not record high last year. The one meat commodity that weren't record high. Why is that? Well, we had a record high beef production last year, buoyed by a very, very high uh, beef cow slaughter and heifer slaughter because of the ongoing drought, that, uh, particularly in the southern plains, but a lot in cattle country. And so uh, that uh, held the lid on prices some, and uh, we were not at at uh, record levels there. Uh, uh, Heifers were not kept for replacement and went into feedlots. In fact, we have the highest percentage of heifers on feed uh, here the last year or so that, that we've ever had, of uh, 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 40% of the, the, the feedlot population is heifers simply because they didn't go, go into uh, with a bull and went into feedlots. And the, the steer numbers were going down because we've had lower uh, – Calf crops, actually, this will be the fifth year lower calf crops. So we, were steered, but we had a lot more heifers kept, uh, kept uh, cattle on feed higher. Then. So uh, let's just get into what we're doing this year then. And the, at least the good news for selling cattle is that this year now it's our turn to be, the cattle sector's turn to be record high. And so uh, here's fed steer prices. And again, fed steers are very important for feeder cattle. Uh, the half the equation for what feeder cattle prices are, what what will fed steers bring, particularly when we we look at those uh, uh, futures prices there for feeder cattle being sold now and and when they'll be slaughtered and so on. But anyway, the purple line again is two thousand is uh, two thousand fourteen. In this case, that was the last year we had record high prices. Two thousand fourteen. There's the. Purple line is 2014 record high prices. Then the red line are this year prices. So we started out the year above. We we're, you know, $20 above there, about 140 up to 160. And they've just continued to march up uh, above last year. So we are going to set a record high this year, uh, all time record high for fed cattle prices, uh, uh, leveled off here through the summer. Usually they'll be down in the summer when our slaughter picks up, but they've held well because of our shorter supplies. And uh, uh, right there, 182 or so. And then I put the gold are the our next year's futures, saying again we're going to have smaller calf crop this year, so we're going to have fewer fed cattle next year. 
So that's going to be supportive to prices. So by next year, futures there and April are up there. Oh, today trading up there between 198 and, and 199, right up there close to 200. So, you know, the prognosis is that our lower supplies, as long as demand uh, holds. Last year, we had record export demand. This year, demand is struggling a little bit on the export market because mainly because of our high price and we have less, but but uh, our, our prices are still responding due to the short supplies. So go to the cap prices, the same story there. The purple line is 2014. That was our previous all-time record high. And uh, we've done better than that throughout the year. So we're going to set a, a, a new record high for feeder for these 550 to 6 weight steers in North Dakota. Uh, not a lot selling yet. We're still a month away from having, uh, you know, bigger runs in the market. And so, uh, but there's still uh, support there, certainly, uh, where it was last year because we've been above where we uh, were. And, and uh, you know, that right there, that little, uh, in, in 2014, see right there, that middle of October is a low. Actually, the last five years, the low, that seasonal low there is right that, middle of October when the first week when a lot of them hit the market, they're balling calves and lean calves and so on. But still very, looks like very, very favorable prices. Go to the heavier weight uh, yearling prices now. And again, we've got, you know, both Napoleon and Dickinson has special uh, uh, grass, yearling grass cattle sales going on right now. Cattle are selling very, very well. The feedlots are after them. Again, we've got a shorter supply, and they like these green northern steers. So tomorrow, those market reports will be out if you want to look at, at the ranges and what they brought and so on. But still trading above throughout the year, uh, 2014, so we're going to set a record again. And there's uh, today's futures market uh, for next year, the 2024 futures, you know, by a year from now up there. At uh, about one, uh, at uh, at uh, two uh, eighty or so, and so uh, uh, better times ahead. It looks like, given again, given our short supply, unless something disastrous happens or we have a drought in the corn belt or something next year that would would affect that. The one market class of cattle that are that haven't been at record high levels this year are cow cow prices, although they've been improving and they go up seasonal anyway and and uh, are strong. They just did not surpass the 2014 the purple line there. A good reason for that, I'll show you that in a minute, is that our beef cow slaughter is still uh, high because of the drought in areas of, of the U.S. And so a lot of cows still coming to market. And again, I just want, you know, a hundred dollars last year was, uh, or last week, uh, a hundred dollar uh, cow prices. I know producer out Tim well, I'm getting more from my cows than that. These are, uh, the, the series that I get from USDA are the 85 to 90% lean cows, which would be typically broken mouth cows that have had a calf on them. So, uh, you know, be probably towards the lower of the market. On the right-hand side there where you see that uh, market report, that's a, is a Monday market report uh, this week from the North Dakota auction. And yeah, there were cows selling for up in the 120s, 118, and the teens and so on higher, and that'd be the higher yielding uh, cows and so on. You know, this series, the, the, the trend would be the same for those better selling cows, but that this is just the, the one that I have access to from USDA. And so uh, like, it all depends on weather next year and you know how much rain we get and, and, and the drought, but we're gonna have fewer cows to sell and so quite likely we'll be at record high levels next year on, on cull cows as well. So again, the story is uh, why are fed steers at record high levels, and you look at the weekly slaughter on the top chart, again, the red line is this year. So we are below last year on steer slaughter, which would be, you know, expected because we've got a lower calf crop the last uh, several years, and we're below average. The purple is average, and blue is last year, red this year again. So uh, that's supporting fed cattle prices. Well, I'll go to the bottom, look at beef cow slaughter. Although, 
the red line is off last year's where we had really, it was really dry. By October of last year, 75% of the beef cow herd was in drought. And now we're at, uh, uh, I've got a slide, the next slide to show you, we're at about 45% are still in drought. That's why we're still above average beef cow slaughter, which is, and you know, tending to keep a, a, a lid on beef cows here. So, you know, here is uh, a map of the U.S. The dark green is where the major, these are by counties, the major uh, uh, cow-calf areas and, and the major density of cows in that county. And then the red dash line is the drought monitor. I didn't bring the current drought monitor. Ron's going to talk more about that in a minute. But you see still a lot of cattle, cows in drought. Down at the bottom, 45% of our cow herd is still in drought. That's leading to the big sales of, of cows and so on. But it's further going to be supportive to prices in the future because we're going to have us. Uh, you know, less no herd rebuilding taking place this year, and will we rebuild the herd uh, next year? That's when we start rebuilding the herd is when prices usually really, really go up because we sell fewer cows and keep heifer calves back. And uh, you see that uh, drought in particular there across the northern North Dakota. Ron's going to talk more about that and, and some uh, USDA help uh, in that case. So, again... Uh, it all depends on weather and do we rebuild the herd and so on. But, you know, here's the 555 to 6 calves and the 7 to 8 feeder steers and fed steers. And you look, you know, I just showed you the 2024 futures, but things look positive now because this is the fifth straight year of a, a lower calf you know, cow numbers probably uh, next year's two is no herd rebuild. So, uh, with that, let's turn it over to Ron, and he'll talk more about the drought and how that's affecting forage uh, conditions here. Uh, Ron Haugen, Extension Farm Management Specialist. I'm going to talk about the uh, Livestock Forage Program. Um, just a little quick description here. LFP, uh, we we especially in 2021, almost every county in the state qualified. Uh, no co counties have qualified until just recently. Um, it, it's payments to li eligible livestock producers with eligible livestock uh, in eligible counties. Uh, payments are based on uh, on the grazing losses suffered in native or improved pasture. Uh, it provides payments to livestock producers. Also, if you're um, if you're on some federal land and then there's a qualifying fire, uh, the FSA does the calculations. The calculations are 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 called monthly payments either one, three, four, or five times the monthly payment rate. Um, it is adjusted by 60%. I'll get into the calculation in a little bit here. The general program provisions then, um, LFP payments are, are based on the drought monitor. And as Tim talked about, the drought monitor comes out every week. And just recently now, uh, eight North Dakota counties qualify. The livestock's that, that that are covered are are a whole range of livestock here from beef to ostrich um and as a livestock producer you must own or share uh, uh, a contract you must own or share or contract the livestock 60 days before the beginning of the drought um you, you must have pasture land either owned or rented you must be in an eligible county or as i mentioned in a in a uh, renting from the federal agency that has stopped grazing because of fire. Uh, you need to certify that you have a loss and file a timely claim. Application is very easy. You just go to your FSA office. You have till 30 days of the end of the calendar year uh, to, to qualify. So that means January 31st, 2024, you've got until uh, uh, that is the deadline for qualifying. Limitation of 125000 and also the AGI of 900,000 applies. So as you look at the drought monitor, there's the different uh, different uh, areas of drought, D2, D3, and D4. Um, you get one payment if you're in D2 for at least eight consecutive weeks. You get three payments if you, you, you're in D3 for at least one, uh, at least one time, uh, or at any time, you get three payments. You get four payments if you're in D3 for four weeks or D4 at any time. And you get five payments if you're in D4 uh, for four weeks, not necessarily four weeks in a row. 
So the drought monitor that came out um, September 5th, that triggered this, that there's a D3 area here in the red. Um, so it, it touch, it's touching eight North Dakota counties. So they qualify at, for getting three payments. Some of these other counties up here, they're in D2. They may qualify uh, uh, until the end of the grazing period. We don't know, depending on the weather. So these payments, uh, uh, these counties here, there's eight of them that will get three payments. You can see they're showing on the map here. This next map here shows if in one more week, these four counties to the west remain in D2, they will get one payment. And one more week for these eight counties, they will increase their from three payments to four payments. We don't know about Pembina or Walsh yet. They may take a little couple more weeks then before they end up in, in, the, in the one payment area. We have a tool online. Here is the, here is the, um, the uh, link so you can go and actually estimate your payment if you're any, in any of those counties. Basically, it's an Excel spreadsheet. You plug in all the yellow cells. You put in your name. You can pick North Dakota, Minnesota, and South Dakota. Pick your county, and you put in your number of head for the various livestock and any and any shares. And these payments that are set are are set in statute now for this coming year. Uh, the adult beef was raised to fifty eight twelve. So you can see here uh, this monthly feed cost. If you had a hundred adults and, and 50 non-adults, 500 pounds or more, more it would be 7,991. The next part of the calculator, you put in your pasture land. Uh, this is a, for the simple example, let's say 1,100 acres of native pasture land and 200 acres of improved. Um, the, 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 uh, the spreadsheet pulls in the animal units for the, for the county, and you get, uh, based on those calculations, 14,000 529. Uh, then the last thing you take the lesser of A or B. A was 79.91, B was 14.5. You take 7.991 times 60%, and the county would be three payments. This is a this is assuming a Benson County example here. Um, and then you and then you take off 5.7% for sequestration. That would be your payment. Uh, pretty simple. All you do is go to your FSA office and give them the information and certify that, and you and you will get some payment uh, just because the drought monitor triggered your county. Okay, next, I guess we're going to David to to finish up here. So I just have a few uh, comments to make about some recent developments in biofuels. I apologize for the walls of text, um, but they're driven by that and not by figure. So the, the first uh, piece of news, which is very positive for the biofuels industry for the next decade or so, uh, is a draft rule from the California Air Resources Board. Uh, so we've talked about CARB a lot. Um, they oversee California's low carbon fuel standard, uh, which incentivizes uh, the use of low carbon fuels, mandates it, and then creates a cap and trade system to uh, incentivize the use of those fuels. Uh, every few years, uh, CARB reviews the regulations and uh, identifies possible changes. Uh, they're just completing that process now. Uh, in the last week, they sent to uh, the Office of Finance in California, they're the folks who review this uh, prior to them being issued. Uh, but anyways, they sent their numbers over and what we saw was they actually want to increase the target emissions mandate from 20% of the 2010 baseline to 30%. So essentially, uh, they because the program has been relatively successful, uh, because of changes in technology and market and all of that, uh, they want to toughen the mandate, uh, increasing that emissions reduction to uh, increase a reduction uh, by 50%, really substantial. Uh, and just to put it in layman's terms, so in 2030, the, the average carbon footprint of transportation fuel sold in the state has to be at least 30% less than that 2010 average. Uh, here's Most of this is a chart from CARB. Uh, and what it is, the black is what actually happened in terms of compliance. That's uh, 
uh, years past. And then the, the gray line with the black dot showed the future compliance targets by year through, through 2030. And again, you can see it goes to that negative 20% number at that time. And then at the bottom right-hand corner, we have that proposed mandate. So I'm not going to draw in the line. Uh, I haven't seen the actual proposed rule. I'd assume it is going to be uh, a, a constant uh, reduction um, by year. But again, that, that change, uh, that proposed change is really quite significant. Uh, one of the reasons this might be happening and one of the reasons it's good news for biofuels uh, is its impact on carbon credit prices. That is the, in, the incentive for uh, marketing these, these low carbon fuels in California. Uh, this chart, which I've shown versions of in the past, show the volume of credits transacted, which are the, the blue bars, and then the, the small horizontal bars show the price uh, of that carbon. They actually have three different ones. But we can see if we go back to about 2020, the price of carbon was about $20, excuse me, $200 a metric ton. Uh, it's declined more recently to, to around a $70, $80 level, a substantial reduction, which again means there's uh, less of incentive to bring that next gallon to market. Uh, and again, a, a likely driver of this change. Uh, just to be clear on what this means, um, this is extremely supportive of increased biofuel use. Uh, in 2020, California was about 15% of the nation's biofuel use. Uh, that'll probably be 20% this year uh, with a rapid increase in the adoption of renewable diesel. Uh, and so we don't know exactly where we're going to be in 2030. It certainly does not mean that we're going to necessarily use 50% more biofuel. Uh, again, the actual mechanism uh, and the way in which th that goal can be reached leaves it up to the market. Uh, so, you know, the, the price of low carbon fuels, the introduction of low carbon fuels, the possibility of, uh, you know, innovative things happening is certainly out there. Uh, but we'll we'll see exactly what it means, but it's very much bullish for for biofuels and consequently for all of agriculture. It's interesting that this news hasn't hit the mainstream uh, egg press yet, uh, but it is going to be extremely impactful, uh, you know, on par with the LCFS uh, that's been uh, really, really important to agriculture in the last five years, especially. Uh, also to know, too, so that the mandates are going to start changing in 2025. So that line uh, is going to be drawn from 2025 to, to 2030. Uh, but it's important to know, too, because these credits can be carried over. Uh, there's a media, there's an immediate impact on biofuel markets. Uh, there was and is concern that uh, the renewable diesel market uh, is was mature or, or growing close to maturity, that the capacity uh, announced uh, and under construction uh, might have led to a, a glut in renewable diesel. With this, that that's likely not the case. Uh, although some future projects may still be uh, be left uncompleted. Uh, talking quick, really about uh, carbon pipelines, uh, getting a lot of press, both in the mainstream press and the egg press locally. Uh, Talking specifically about the summit, although the, the recent developments are, are hitting uh, many of the Midwestern uh, carbon dioxide pipelines, summit specifically is going to collect uh, CO2 from ethanol refineries in North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, Iowa, bring that to North Dakota, uh, Central Western North Dakota, uh, bury it in the geology. Uh, the driver for this, again, is, is, is a federal tax credit 45Q, which was dramatically dramatically increased last year. Uh, and then also uh, those policies, programs that incentivize reducing carbon footprints. For example, California's LCFS. Um, the news in this space is that uh, permits in North Dakota and just recently South Dakota have been denied uh, in the last two months. This doesn't mean that that these folks can't and they, they certainly will uh, reapply, uh, but, but negative news for both of them. At the same time in Iowa, they're having hearings now and expect to have their decision by the end of the month. Those, those conversations have been really quite heated uh, and a bit of a question of which way it would go. Obviously, uh, 
they certainly need to have the permit in North Dakota to get to the geology, uh, but the loss of any of these states would really change the, the profitability of, of, of the, the project as a whole. Last thing I want to talk about uh, is federal sustainable aviation fuel greenhouse gas modeling. So it's very, very important when you look at the value of biofuels uh, you know, to, to different places to consider that, that carbon footprint. And how we calculate that is really, really important. Uh, there's a couple of different ways in which we do this. Most recently, the GREET model and I'm not going to read the whole acronym for you, but the GREET model has really started to dominate. California uses a version of the GREET model um, to, to calculate carbon footprints. And what the, the ethanol industry in the United States wants to do is they want to make sure that the federal government, the IRS, use GREET when calculating the carbon footprint of alcohol to jet. So ethanol, corn ethanol, Converted into sustainable aviation fuel. And the reason they want to do that is compared to the alternative, which is the Corsia model, uh, which is the international model. You know, the, 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 the agreed model doesn't fully account for or hopefully penalize indirect land use change. So the ethanol folks very, very much want to see GREEP be used because it will increase the likelihood uh, that refineries will be eligible or increase the volume uh, available from those refineries because it won't be hit as, as much. Uh, a piece of news from this week, uh, in addition to folks just you know drawing attention to and lobbying for uh, that desired change, the USDA did just announce that they are going to spend almost half a million dollars to uh, support the expansion of GREET to consider SAF. And so that's, you know, it's going to go to the folks who, who manage GREET to, to more fully build out the model for that that specific use. Uh, one point that is pretty important, without the carbon pipelines, the ethanol carbon footprint is probably too big no matter what to ever make the SAF levels. The SAF has a, a mandate uh, of a, a certain reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And this, this might all be for not if, if, if the pipelines aren't built. It essentially exclude uh, the ethanol industry from that market, which they're very much looking forward to, to becoming involved with. So those were my comments. Uh, at this time, we'll open it up for, for questions or comments. I would also ask the other presenters if there's anything they'd like to add uh, about their own topic or, or other things they might have thought of uh, when others were speaking. Yeah, yeah well, Ron, I think you said that the that the uh, LFP model was Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota, isn't it? It not Minnesota; it's Montana, isn't it? It's oh, the, I, yeah. Sorry about that. I meant to say Montana and South Dakota. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and one other thing I want to say: I'm I'm with the uh, our newsletter that w that we put out. If you're not receiving it, um, email me. You know, the best way, you know, just Google my name, Brian Parman, NDSU, uh, email me and I'll put you on the list uh, if you would like to be one of the folks who re receive our uh, monthly newsletter that we put out. I'd like to thank everybody for attending and the other panelists for presenting. Uh, we will be meeting next month. Uh, this time it'll be Thursday, October 12th, not Friday the 13th, the day before that happens. Uh, but we'll be back after the next WASD report on that Thursday. We, oh, did we get a question? Nope. Just comment. Uh, but thanks everybody for attending and we'll see you next month. Thanks.